to think life prepares you for one moment, one opportunity, a minute where every experience you've ever had really comes into play, where everything you do is really important. As important as life and death. Louis Chevrolet had such a moment, and in fact, plenty of it. He had been racing all his life, but in 1905, the three miles would be his first opportunity on American soil. It's either ride or die, now or never. Louis had no business winning, but when he did, he shocked the entire nation. His victory made him a star. But then, that's the thing with stars. The brighter they shine, the closer they are to obliteration. What I'm about to tell is how one man became an overnight sensation, but later on, the guy nobody wanted to be like in one lifetime. Louis was a grass to gray story. He was born to a humble family from the Swiss town of La Chaux de Fonds on the 25th of December, 1878. As a lad, Louis had an exceptional love for mechanics. You could say it was his natural habitat, and anything that sought to take him away was keenly rebuffed. But that also meant going against his father's humble profession as a watchmaker. When you think of it, both professions have a slight similarity. However, Louis' ambition to become an auto mechanic was set in stone. If he succeeds, the lives of his parents and six siblings, Alfred, Fanny, Bertha, and Arthur, Martha, and Gaston, would never remain the same. When Louis was nine years old, his family moved to Boone, France. It was here he got his first job with Robin Howledge Contracting Company. As the story goes, Louis was asked to repair the vehicle of an American guest residing at the Hotel de la Poste. Guess who that turned out to be? The multi-millionaire William K. Vanderbilt, grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt was quite taken by the young man's dexterity as he repaired his steam-driven tricycle, which at that time was the talk of the town. Vanderbilt handsomely tipped young Louis, but much more than that, he painted in his mind a picture of the American dream. At the end of the day, Louis had two towering ambitions, to migrate to America and to build the world's swankiest automobile. Louis discovered his talents from an early age. Unlike us, he didn't spend years floating around different disciplines in a bid to find the right one. He knew what he wanted to do and poured out his heart to see it happen. You may consider him lucky, I guess. Another special thing about Louis was that his passion and skills were closely connected. As you already know, he was an excellent mechanic, but even more, he had a passion for racing, through which the world has come to know him for his famous quotes. Movement is the universal language of personal freedom. True to his words, Louis felt on top of the world whenever he raced. Beyond the ambition, beyond the glory, even beyond the price money, Louis raced for freedom. It was his heart's passion and he was content with it, and it didn't matter how long he had to keep up with the dirt, dust, and heat of the racetrack. Louis began racing as a teenager. You'd often find him behind the hills of Boone, crushing his mates in local cycle races. Already he had a wealth of experience fixing bicycles at Roblin Howledge, and that knowledge would help him build his first bicycle, which he named the Frontenac. With his latest invention, Louis wasn't just any racer. He had now become a part of the long list of inventors. And it's no surprise because the 19th century was an eventful era. Everyone had a million dollar idea, so it was a struggle to stay ahead of the competition. You have to be really talented to do that, and Louis fit the description perfectly. In 1899, Louis moved to Paris after getting a job with the automobile manufacturer Alexander Darac. At the time, Alexander had sold off his bicycle production company and was in the business of making electric cars. It was with Alexander that Louis learned everything he knew about combustion engines. What's more, he had once again been initiated into the flashy world of automobiles, and he loved it. Remember, Louis was a racer, so anything light on its feet and fast, I mean dead fast, easily caught his attention. Now, the next move on his chessboard was migrating to the United States, the land of opportunities. New York was a bustling city in the early 1900s. With a population of 3.4 million people, it was one of the busiest places in America. Impressive landmarks were being constructed. The New York Stock Exchange, the Williamsburg Bridge, the Flatiron Building, 
the Coney Island, and perhaps the greatest of all, the New York City subway system. When Louis arrived on its shores, he wasn't given a triumphant welcome. He, like most travelers aboard that vessel, was just an ordinary immigrant, who would either rise to prominence or be swallowed up in the crowd. Louis got a job as a mechanic for the Dudion Bhutan Motor Car Agency, but it was only temporary because deep in his mind was that ambitious picture painted by William Vanderbilt more than a decade ago. It had led him to the US, but he didn't come all the way to end up a mechanic, no matter how skillful he was. Louis wanted to race, so he did everything possible to get behind the wheel of a race car. And you know what? Louis did not disappoint. In his first attempt, Louis Chevrolet humiliated the great American driver Barney Oldfield in the 1905 Three Miles Road Race, finishing with a mile record of 52.8 seconds. It was mind-blowing. He became an overnight sensation. Right from his very first victory, he would go on to set records on every important track in the United States. He was literally a god on the racetrack, and other drivers either dreaded him or ended up in his shadow. In fact, they called him the daredevil Frenchman. In 1906, Louis Chevrolet set up his first automobile company, which he called the Chevrolet Keenan Auto Company. Sadly, the company never saw the light of day. Strange, isn't it? Later that year, he joined Walter Christie in designing a front-drive race car with a Dirac V8 engine, which pioneered a new world record. By this time, Louis' fame had spread through the nooks and crannies of America and his posters would have ended up on the walls of road race junkies. However, that was just the beginning. A few years later, Louis would get acquainted with an automobile businessman by the name William C. Durant. William started his automobile company, General Motors, in 1908. He was aggressively expansive and wasted no time buying up automobile companies on the brink of bankruptcy. However, this business strategy through which he consolidated old motor works and Cadillac would be his undoing. William was ousted from his position as general manager when the company's revenue hit rock bottom. However, he wasn't one to be put off easily, as we've seen from his renowned quote. Forget past mistakes, forget failures, forget everything except what you're going to do now and do it. William had transformed his automobile conglomerates from nothing to being the second best-selling automobile company in the United States. Being voted out of the company he founded was heartbreaking, but the experience birthed a billion dollar idea. All the while, Louis Chevrolet had been winning important races around the US. William C. Durant had been a secret admirer. But one day, he gave the famous Swiss driver an offer he couldn't refuse. A couple of days later, Louis became William Durant's chief mechanic. It was an ingenious partnership in one of the world's busiest eras, but on the flip side, William's partnership with Louis was a Trojan horse, because through it, he had access to his greatest asset, the name Chevrolet. Soon enough, William began to convince Louis into creating a car brand for himself. William knew the automobile business like the back of his hand, so if he tells you that a good name sells faster, you just have to believe him. Louis eventually bought into the idea, and on November 3, 1911, the Chevrolet Motor Car Company started. A year later, the company's first model, the Classic 6, was manufactured. But there was a slight problem. William Durant and Louis Chevrolet never met eye to eye to decide what the car should look like. So, while William was expecting lighter cars that would compete with Ford on the market, Louis was building swanky race cars that carried a price tag of $2,250. William saw the Classic 6 as a total misdirection. As a matter of fact, he decided to market an entirely different car model but the sales were disappointing. Then he tried marketing the Classic 6 as well. The results were the same, poor. It wasn't the best of beginnings for the newly found company. Nevertheless, the cars were spectacular. Each featured a 299 SID 6, the biggest engine offered in any Chevrolet vehicle for the next four decades, but its impressive specs weren't enough to sustain an expiring relationship. As amazing as the business partnership between Louis Chevrolet and William Durant could have been, they were just not compatible. Louis wanted race cars, while Durant wanted a people's vehicle. For the years it lasted, their partnership only produced the H-Series Baby Grant, the Royal Mail models, and the Light 6 L-Series model, and also the iconic bowtie logo, which no one knows its origin. 
Some folks believe it must have been the wallpaper of a hotel room Louis Chevrolet once stayed in. Others conclude it's an altered version of the Swiss cross. But a third group insists it was modeled after the logo of the Colette's Coal Company. Whichever the case, the iconic emblem has made a name for itself. And I bet the next time you see a golden bow tie on the hood of a vehicle, this video will come to mind. And that's good for us. In 1914, William Durant and Louis Chevrolet went their separate ways. Louis liquidated his shares and left the company to pursue his passion for race cars. The only thing Louis didn't take along was his name. With Louis gone, William was at liberty to manufacture the type of vehicles he wanted. And I can tell you, it was the best years of his life. The new Chevrolet model sold like crazy. Within a few years, William was bagging more greens than he could imagine. In no time, every Dick and Harry wanted a Chevrolet. And William C. Durant was back in business. Also, Chevrolet became the first automobile brand to outsell Ford. By sheer determination, Durant had smashed the top item on his wish list. He took the profits from the sale of Chevy cars and bought more shares in his former company, General Motors. Next, he offered the same stakeholders who once voted him out of the company he founded a five-for-one deal. Five shares of Chevrolet stock for every one share of GM stock. The offer was a bit outrageous, but given the rising market value of Chevrolet, it was worth the risk. William bought back his original company and consolidated the Chevrolet Motor Car Company into his former General Motors company. Now, don't get carried away with William's achievements, because life had also been eventful for Louis Chevrolet. He made a fortune from his brief stint with William Durant, and shortly after the fallout, he founded the Frontenac Motor Corporation. His newer models were fantastic. Louis smashed his second ambition by making undisputed race cars. The Frontenac would go on to win several races, including the prestigious Indianapolis 500. Also, his brothers Arthur and Gatton had joined him in the racing business. In their heydays, the Chevrolet brothers were remarkable, dreadful, intimidating, and innovative. They won spectacular victories, but as they say, a star shines the brightest before it dies. If Louis Chevrolet had been told he would take a permanent break from the tracks at a young age, he definitely would have doubted it. But it happened. On November 25th, 1920, Louis experienced one of the few devastating losses in his entire career. Sadly, it wasn't the loss of an important race, and neither did he lose any of his choice vehicles. His brother, Gaston, died while racing in Beverly Hills, LA. There were a few other bitter experiences in Louis' life. The fallout with Durant and his brother Arthur and the failure of his aircraft company, all from which he recovered. But Gaston's death was a mind breaker. He quit the tracks for good. In the 1930s, Louis Chevrolet was at his wit's end. He had succeeded as a race car driver, but miserably failed as a businessman. He was fading away, slowly forgotten, dying while the cars that bore his name had risen to prominence, becoming one of America's top three automobiles. Louis went back to the company he co-founded. Surprisingly, William Durant had been ousted from the company more than a decade ago. We know William as a fighter, and indeed, he fought really hard. But this time, he had no famous name he could bank on. He made some average sales from his new automobile company, but the Great Depression of the 1930s put him out for good. Then, he tried his hands on a string of bully alleys, but that failed as well. The once renowned William C. Durant died in a corner of the world, forgotten. As for Louis, he continued working for General Motors as a mechanic, nothing more. He had become a man beaten by years, and the glories of his youth were just memories. Louis had enjoyed his 15 minutes of fame, and now the spotlight had turned away from him. Louis Joseph Chevrolet died on June 6, 1941. He was only 63. Over the years, Chevrolet automobiles have thrived without any connection to its eponymous founder. Its golden era was in the 1950s, when Americans cited advertising slogans such as Like a Rock and See the USA in Your Chevrolet due to the launching of the Chevrolet Corvette and the Bel Air Sport Coupe. Chevrolet has been and still is impressive. Today, we have seen the latest models such as the Silverado, Bolt EV, Impala, Camara, Malibu, and a host of others. Newer generations have fallen in love with Chevrolet, 
but only a few of them know its history.